Praise God. It's wonderful. We need to, every morning when we wake up, we need to look up and say, while we're still in bed, thank you, Lord, for preserving me for another wonderful day. His creation every single day. And thank you, and that's the beginning of your thanks. And you should be thanking throughout the entire day for the beautiful things of God has created. And you have to think about something. This is a world in sin. But it's a type and shadow of a heavenly world. Okay? Just think of what the heavenly world must be like if this is so beautiful and it's in sin. When you look at the sky and the stars and the, and the sun, the, the Gulf of Mexico, the sand, and you think there's something a lot, lot better, more beautiful than this waiting for us in heaven. Praise God. <clears throat> Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us. And Lord, we ask that you open the eyes and ears and hearts of our understanding that we may receive more of you this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Okay, today's <coughs> title, today's message is, Lord, pluck the strings of my heart with music of love. Lord, pluck the strings of my heart with music of love. And we'll see how that works out here. We'll go right down to the first uh, title, subtitle, which is Conductor. Now, the conductor here is a conductor in an orchestra, okay? And I got this from Wikipedia's encyclopedia, and it says here, conductors act as guides to the orchestras and or choirs they conduct. So they act as guides to the orchestras and the choirs they conduct. They choose the works to be performed and study their scores to which they may make certain adjustments, that is regarding tempo or articulation or phrasing, repetitions of sections, and so on. They work out their interpretation and relay their vision to the performers. They may also attend to organizational matters such as, incidentally, what we're talking about is you, because you are an orchestra. You are an orchestra. They may also attend to organizational matters, such as scheduling rehearsals, planning a concert season, hearing additions, and selecting members, and promoting their ensemble in the media. That's the definition of a conductor. Well, how exactly does that relate? Okay. Again, as I said, we're an orchestra here of different instruments. Each of us, if you're a child of God is a chosen instrument of God. And notice something. <clears throat> we all play different tunes, don't we? Everyone speaks differently. Everyone, when the Lord strokes, when the Lord strokes us with a revelation, when the Lord strokes us, we emit a different sound. Because we're different. And we're all different, different instruments in an orchestra. Okay. Now let's read about <clears throat> our schoolmaster, which is a conductor here, okay? Let's use that analogy. Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. Now I'll read the bold face first to give you an idea of what's going on, and then we'll go back and take a look at the, examining it. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For there have to, if there had been a law given which could have given life, Verily, righteousness should have been seen, excuse me, should have been by the law. Righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under, under sin. The scripture hath concluded all under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law shut up unto faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus, excuse me, by faith in Christ Jesus. So, let me just go back and start at the beginning of this then and look at what, what's actually happening here now, okay? 
is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. Well, what would the law do to us? The law will kill you, every one of us, because we can't possibly keep the law. So the law will kill us. If you sin, you die. That's the law. Okay? Is the law again, then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily, verily means truth in the Greek, righteousness should have been by the law. And righteousness is, in the Greek, it's justification. It is comes from the root word, which means innocence. It means holiness. It's what happens to you when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Pow! You become justified. You become holy. You become innocent because the Lord Jesus has paid for all your sins. And you are now innocent. Okay? Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. But... The scripture has concluded all under sin. So we're all under sin. We're all born under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. That the promise of faith, the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Now Jesus Christ, what does Christ mean? It means, let's go down to our first footnote. Christ means <clears throat> the anointed. It, Anointed me. Anointing is when when everything oil is smeared all over you. Okay, anointing. It comes through the idea of contact. Contact, like when Jesus touches us. Contact. Okay. To smear or rub with oil, which comes from the root word to handle, to touch slightly. And that's what Jesus did to us. And that's what we do when we go out into the world. When we talk to people, we don't even actually physically have to touch them. We touch them with the Word of God. We're touching people continually with our actions even. And sometimes we don't have to, they didn't have to speak. Like the, the Rust Commission, we, we pick up food, and, and donated food, and we give away food, and, and we're, we're touching people without ever preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because you know we're, they're, they're looking at our actions, our deeds. Okay. Okay. So um, it, it says here, uh, uh, but the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. So before we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we're all under sin. What's that mean? Sin, you die. That's the deal. You swear, you go to hell. You murder somebody, you go to hell. I mean, the two deeds appear to us to be entire, uh, one extreme to the other, but in fact, both have the same result, the same penalty. You sin, you die. You go to hell. Okay? But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Revealed means to take, to, take off the cover to dis, disclosed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. And I'm going to put that up there. The law was our schoolmaster. The law was our schoolmaster. Well, what does schoolmaster mean? Let's look at the second footnote here. The law was our schoolmaster. In the Greek, it means a boy leader. A boy leader a servant whose office it was to take the children to school, a tutor, an instructor, comes from a combination of another word which means to lead, bring, drive, carry, lead away. A schoolmaster. And it says here, a boy leader, okay? Now we, we, our schoolmasters, we normally conceive of them as being men or, or women as the case might be. But now he had here a, a boy leader, okay? A commentary about that. Symbolically, a boy leader here and represents the law. And it is a definite inference to a lack of maturity. A boy is not immature, is he? So there's a definite inference here to a lack of maturity, isn't there? Grace being that graduation mark and maturity that is adulthood achieved. But when we graduate from school, when we graduate from the law, 
we receive grace. That's adulthood. Grace. Okay? What's it say here? The law is to teach us. It's to give us, bring us into a, a knowledge and understanding so that we can receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and walk in grace. That's what a schoolmaster is all about. Let's go to the third footnote here. Commentary. Yes, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Well, when you graduate from school, you're no longer under a schoolmaster, are you? But we have, but, but have we, because we're no longer under a schoolmaster and we're all out of school now, have we erased, removed, wiped out, or expunged, or forgotten the law, which was the schoolmaster, which, which the schoolmaster taught us? Have we forgotten everything? We just got out of school, even if we only went to 12th grade or 10th grade or 5th grade. Have you forgotten everything? You just, as soon as you got out of school, that's it. Wipe a clean slate and start over again now. Not so. You kept those things that you were taught. Parts of those things, and they're all in your subconscious mind, but even in your conscious mind, you kept a lot of those things that you were taught. Same way with the law. The law is our schoolmaster. The law teaches us that we're sinners. The law teaches us that we need forgiveness. The law teaches us that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins. The law teaches us grace. It leads, shouldn't teach us, it leads us to grace. The law leads us to grace. Now, once we get saved, once we get born again, that's it. We forget all about what the law taught us and everything and all these things. Thou shalt not this and thou shalt not this. And we forget all those things, right? All the ten, ten Commandments. Now, they're all gone now because that was the law, man. That was the schoolmaster. We don't need that now because we ain't got grace. Do we forget that? Do you forget what you learned in school? No. It will always be with you. The law will always be be with you. You will not forget that. You won't erase that, cause that to be non-existent. You will always keep the law in your heart. But now you have grace. Okay. What does that mean? Let me give you the analogy about with your body, okay? I'm going to draw a skeleton form of a And same here, okay? I have a body. That's the bones of your body. You know, some of us, when we die, will be cremated, burned. You know you can't burn bones? The bones don't burn. So when they're done with the cremation, all the flesh is gone, and all that remains is the bones, okay? The bones, can, in fact, and to give you a little bit further than that, the Bible says, not a bone of his body was broken, speaking of Jesus Christ. What does the bones represent? Well, the bones are the things in your body that keep you from being coming a jellyfish, because that's what you'd be without the bones. Uh, keeping you, and I'm, I'm using my bones to stand upright and to do this thing and that thing, and to, to move and to gesture and to, to walk, and but the bones represent the law that I learned as a child, as a child in Christ, right, as in, under a schoolmaster. The bones represent the law. And what, what else now? And my flesh, and my flesh represents grace. And my flesh is flexible, isn't it? My flesh will bend, it will turn, you can do things to it. It comes, I mean, my flesh is flexible. But I am complete now, aren't I not? I have the bones of a law, and I have the flesh of grace, and I'm complete in terms of human body. And so are you now. Before you got saved and before you got born again, well, I can't make that analogy, so I won't. So let me go back here a bit now and let's pick up this, this text that I left it off and it said this. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. 
But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should, should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Notice that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. It's like the conductor of an orchestra. The law was, is like a conductor of an orchestra. We are the instruments, and he's conducting us. And each of us are approaching our, our, it's like in school. Well, each of us, even though we may be in the same grade, we're uh, are different accomplishments at different levels, okay? Because we're individuals. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Justified means, in the Greek, rendered just or innocent, become righteous by faith. By faith. But after faith, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We don't live. You sin, you die. That's it. We don't live like a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of Christians, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you know what's called a legalist. A legalist is still living in the Old Testament. He's living under the law. Well, that's what, he, if he can live under the law, that's what he gets. Okay? He's, this is it. You sin, you die. Oh, you're supposed to do this. And um, the law says, what the Bible say? Well, the Bible says, and so anyway, that's it. It's like, it's like uh, this rescue mission. I have 20-some um, people who are on staff, okay? If every time they sinned, I said, get out, be gone! How many people would I have on staff within two days? <laughs> and I'd have to leave too! <laughs> you see? So that's legalism. That's legalism. This is what the law says. This is what you got to do. That's it. But we're under... We're not under legalism anymore. We've been raised above that. It's part of us, yes, but we've been raised above that, and now we have grace and gracious flexibility. So now there's forgiveness. So now when I talk to someone in my staff who sinned, well, uh, da, 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 so over, rattle, 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 so over, and so on, and we talk back and forth, and I see some, some type of a, 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 a sorrow and, and a sadness for having, having sinned in that, and I can forgive. Can I forgive under the law? Absolutely not. There's no forgiveness. You sin, you die. That's it. You see, that's the rigid, that's like jail. Okay? That's like the penitentiary, a really high, strict penitentiary, like a like jail. You sin, you die. That's it. You get out and you broke, broke the rules, bang, you know? But we're not that. We are a church. We are the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. We have forgiveness. So that's what that was all about there, okay? We are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in, in, in Christ Jesus. I wanted to get that across because now what we're going to do is we're going to read a psalm, a psalm of, which I've entitled myself, Make Me a Loving Instrument. God is love, correct? Now let me ask you something. Does, does love say, you sin, you die? Love has forgiveness, doesn't it? See, grace. Okay. No, but we're a combination. All right. Now, I'll read this uh, uh, Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 3, and I'll read the black, the bold face first. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Now, if you just start thinking about what's, what that said, the, the, the Psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. That's beautiful. That's beautiful in itself. The words, you see, a psalm, well, let's hear, let's, let's go back, let's go down to the first footnote, and I'll explain why. It says here, what a psalm actually is. Psalm in the Hebrew means this. It means properly instrumental music. A psalm is instrumental music, okay? By implication, a poem set to notes comes from the, uh, from the uh, uh, root word through the idea of striking with the fingers. Striking with the fingers. 
Strike him with the fingers. It's like you're an instrument and God is striking you with his fingers. He's striking you with his fingers. Properly to touch. That's what Jesus did. He touched. Properly to touch. To strike with the fingers to touch. The string. To touch the strings or parts of a musical instrument. Play upon it. That's what God is doing with us. We are each an, a musical instrument. We have strings, perhaps, okay? And God is, is playing those strings. He's touching those strings. Now, God is love. God is love. And Jesus Christ, therefore, is love as well. And the Holy Spirit is love. And the music that's being played, God is playing us to bring forth the music of love. The music of love. Because he's bringing forth our love out of us. He's touching us with his love. He's playing us. At the, he's, he's tweaking the strings of, 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 of us who are an instrument, okay? And he's bringing forth our love out of us by tweaking us, by loving us. And that he's selecting the notes, you see, to each of us. Each of us is getting a little bit of a different message. We're not getting the same message, boys and girls. We're just getting a different kind of a message, the one that we can comprehend more so than anybody else, because God is using the things that are inside of us. And he's playing us as an instrument. He's and he's, he's plucking us, plucking us like a guitar. And he's playing us as an instrument and bringing forth our love out of us by his loving touch. Isn't that wonderful? A psalm is properly a instrumental music. By implication, it's a poem set to notes through the idea of striking with the fingers, properly to touch the strings or parts of a musical instrument, to play upon it. Music, make music accompanied by voice, hence celebrate in song and music, give praise, sing forth praises. Make me a loving instrument. You can hear the music, you see. You're hearing my music today. God is using me. I'm an instrument, and he's plucking the strings of my heart that are speaking, sounding to you. He's plucking the strings of my heart, and hopefully he's, he's, he's uh, the combination of God plucking and bringing forth out of me is bringing forth my love outward toward you and that's what we all should be doing all the time we should be allowing God to pluck the strings of our heart to bring forth love his love combined with our love unto all those who can hear the music and it's the music of love it's all love praise God praise God to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the heavens, now the heavens are, it means here all the heavenly company, the heaven, that includes the, the stars as well, and of course the stars, we're becoming the stars, so you're, you're getting that imagery, uh, hopefully, all right? All the heavenly company, the heavens, declare the glory of God, and declare means, in the, in the Hebrew means to enumerate, to celebrate, to count, to speak, to tell, to proclaim the glory of God. That's that's the music of love. When you're proclaiming the glory of God. Because God is love. And his glory is love. Proclaiming the God of love. A Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Now showeth means in Hebrew means praises. That's these things around us. Like I told you, like when I, I, I'm coming today, I live out on the beach. When I'm coming, I drive down the beach to go down to Treasure Island and I come across, I'm looking at all the, first I'm looking at all the, all the Gulf of Mexico out there. Okay, I'm a right as I'm coming down the beach from Madura Beach. And then I, I'm looking at, at the resort houses and the, the place, uh, all the boats and cars and people. And then I turn left and I, I see the palm trees and I, I see that I'm coming across the bridges and, and I see all these, this beautiful blue sky. And that's all, that's all God. That's the music that God has created. 
We just have to take time to look at it. Time to perceive the beauty of it. Time to perceive the loveliness of it. That's the firmament. That represents the firmament here. The firmament, because the firmament show it, that's manifest his handiwork. And those are the manifestations of God. As we look around us, we see the manifestations of God. And I see, and quite frankly, this orchestra that I'm the conductor of right at this moment here, I'm looking around and I'm seeing the manifestations of God. You're all manifestations of God. Each and every one of you is a different instrument. No two of any of us play the same melody or the same tune exactly the same way with the same notes. But we're all instruments of God. All. And it's the glory of God that I'm looking at. A beautiful, wonderful orchestra of holy people. You. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day and today utter a speech, and day and today, that is the heavenly company, utter speech. And night unto night, hey, wait a minute, day and today, the heavenly company utter speech. Who can hear that? Well, if you're saved and born again, only you can hear that. The unsaved can't hear that at all. The unsaved got their eyes to the girth, to the ground. They're caterpillars. And we're, when we're adoring God, butterflies. Adoring God, praising God. Butterflies in the air. Enjoying His glory. Which is becoming our glory is becoming our glory. Praise God. Day unto day, utter speech, and night unto night, the firmament showeth knowledge. The firmament showeth. So we see the examples around us all the time. We're just not paying attention to them. We need to realize these are types and shadows of heaven. Types of shadows aren't the same thing. They're just parts. they just a, a very small part. Uh, my shadow is nothing like what I really am. It's just, well, it is like something like I really am, but not much. It's just an empty shadow. And all these things we look around us that are so beautiful, they have been created by God to, to firm it, are just shadows of what's yet to come. That we cannot, we do not have the, the cognitive ability to be able to understand those things. We can't perceive them. They're beyond us. They're beyond us. It's all waiting for us, however, in heaven. For every one of us, it's waiting for us. The glory of God is waiting for you. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. So true. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Anybody in, in deepest Africa, in, in, in the middle of the Antarctica, any place in the world, can just look around them and see the glory of God. If, they, if, they're, if they're opening their hearts to God, they can see it. And if they haven't opened their hearts to God, all they see is ice and snow in the one and, and jungle and danger and evil in the other. They don't see it. But it's there. It's all there for us to see. We have to realize that the things that we're looking at are really not reality. Reality lasts forever. These trees that we're looking at, these beautiful trees, this, this, uh, all these, uh, th uh, the sun, the moon, the star, all this stuff, this is not reality because it doesn't last forever. I'm going to take back the sun and the moon, but the things that we're looking at here, the mountains and the uh, beautiful flowers and all these things that we, it's not real reality. That's just temporal reality. That's temporary reality. This is temporary. Isn't this beautiful? This is beautiful. God created this. 
I can see this. And I also know this is not reality. Reality is eternal. This is temporary. Okay? It's a type and shadow of the reality waiting for us. But it's temporary. Just like your bodies right now are temporary. They're going to be just like these beautiful flowers. They're going to fade away and go to dust. But that's not the reality that we're experiencing now. Once we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our bodies are going to fade away and go to heaven. We're going to go to heaven. We're going to go to glory. All for us. You have been selected. Each of you who saved and born again have been selected by God. Jesus said, you have not chosen me. I've chosen you. That's what he said. That's a quote. You've been selected by God to participate eternally in, oh yes, beautiful flowers. But can you imagine a thousand times better than that? How about a hundred thousand times better than that? Those flowers in terms of beauty. That's heaven. I can't imagine that. I can do the numbers, but I can't imagine what it could possibly be. But I'm anxious to find out. Let's go down to Psalms chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. As he continues, I'll read the, the bull face. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. What does this mean? They're lying. Let's start with the line here. The line in the Hebrew is a, is a chord as connecting. It's also a musical string. See, we're getting back the musical motif now here going on. It is a, it is a musical string. It's gone out. I would think that would be like horizontal knowledge from man to man, person to person. It's gone out through all the earth. And their words to the end of the world. And that would be the angelic words, the words of the angels the words of the heavenly host and their words to the end of the world in them he's talking now about his words hath he set a tabernacle for the sun now wait a minute a tabernacle in the Hebrew is a tent now we studied the tabernacle right here so called of it's actually the tabernacle of God that's his real name it's called the tabernacle of Moses and just uh, outside the Bible. This is the tabernacle. And he has set a tabernacle, a tent for the Son. That should be S-O-N. His Son, Jesus Christ, rises in the east and goes westward every day. Rises in the east and goes, continue, he doesn't stop, he just continues to go around, round and round and round. In them, in the word of God, and it is in the word of God where you find the tabernacle, isn't it? In the word of God hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. What he's saying is this. Am I holding up the word of God? In them, the words of God, hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. This is a tabernacle, it's a tent. A tent is a temporary covering. Who lives inside here? Jesus Christ. It's a tabernacle for the Son. This is a tent for the Son of God. See that? See what the, this poet is doing? This, this, this poet is, 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 is his poetry. Poetry has wonderful dimensions. That's what this is. I'm holding in my hand a tabernacle for the Son. Praise God. In them, in his words, in his words, 
as he set a tabernacle for the sun. And he continues now, which is as a bridegroom. And who is the bridegroom? We know him to be Jesus Christ, coming to meet us who are the bride, correct? Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And that's how the son is, as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit, that is in the Hebrew, his course, unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Nothing, mean the Amplified has, yes, no one. No one is hidden from the heat of the sun. Our God is a consuming fire. What does that make Jesus Christ? A consuming fire. Or does that make the Holy Spirit? A consuming fire. If Jesus Christ is this sun we're talking about, what is the sun? A consuming fire. S-U-N is a consuming fire. No, no one is hid from the heat thereof. No one is hid from the heat thereof. I'm passing over a lot of stuff. Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 through 10. And the reason I'm, I'll, I'll mention that I'm passing over a lot of things is because they're valuable. You need to read these things that I'm passing over. You in the internet a, a, a congregation need to read these things that are I'm passing over. But for our purposes here, I'm doing it because I just feel led to do that. Psalms chapter 19, verses 7 through 10. <clears throat> the law of the Lord is perfect. <clears throat> now remember, we started off here this psalm. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And now we're reading verse seven, verses 7 through 10. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The Amplified has it restoring the whole person. What does the law do? It, it converts the soul. It leads you to Christ. That's how you graduate. You receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Until that time, you're under the law. No matter how much of the Bible you may have learned, you're still under the law. What does that mean? You sin, you die. That's the deal. Oh, but I know all this. I've read the Bible four times, and I know about this and that. So that's good. You know all those things. Have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? No. Then you sin, you die. You're still under the law. You've not graduated from school. What's wrong with you? I used to teach school. We have people in school who, were, who spent two or three years in the same grades. And in college, the same way. People have been, been, been ten, spent 10 years to get a four-year degree. But that's all right. They got the degree. They graduated. So if you know lots and lots and lots about the Bible and never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you sin, you die. You're under that penalty. You go out and get hit by a truck this afternoon, you're going down the tubes, buddy. That's the case. Oh, but I know this and that, and Lord, I tell, oh, but I read this thing, and I read four times, I read this, and I read all that, this thing. Yeah, I know. You ever received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Well, no, I didn't. Well, down the tubes, buddy. Let me ask you a question. We'll come to it, but I want to anyway. What's, what do you think the unforgivable sin is? Anybody know what the unforgivable sin is? What? Uh huh. And what does that mean? That's uh, that's John nineteen seven, I think. And what does it mean? It's a, a listen. If you murdered somebody and you felt remorse about it, and you asked Jesus Christ to sincerely be your Lord and Savior, and He saved you, can you still get to heaven? How about if you murdered three people? How about if you murdered fifty people? If you rape somebody and you asked, you felt had remorse, and you, how about could you get to heaven if you, you rape somebody? Okay. How about if you rape fifty people? So, okay. Is there anything that you could do that you couldn't get to heaven? There's the man. 
That's the unforgivable sin. That's the only, there's only one unforgivable sin. It is not receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's it. God will forgive you for every evil, terrible, horrible thing that you've ever done in your entire life. But if you don't receive Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, bang, you're going to pay for it all. That's the unforgivable sin. You see, just look at it like this from God's point of view. Will God let anybody into heaven who's not saved and born again? Just think about it like that. No. So that's the unforgivable sin right there. You've got to be saved and born again. Will God let murderers come in? Yes, if they if they receive Jesus. We left rapists. We let this thing. And we're druggies. How about you? All half of us here are druggies. All right. And I used to be a druggie myself. Okay. We, 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 can we get to heaven? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. How about the tithe? We're going to do the tithe at the end. I and mean, lots of people don't tithe. When God wants us to tithe, He says, "Would you rob God? Can you get to heaven if you don't tithe?" Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you don't receive Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you're going to hell. Period. Okay, let's go to... Now, the, Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. <laughs> it does make wise the simple. Wisdom, uh, I forget the Proverbs that go with that, but it talks about wisdom is the, uh, you know some James, do you, can you quote anything? Anyway, wisdom is the principal thing. Uh, huh? Well, okay, we'll continue now. Uh, making wise and simple. The statutes, that's the precepts of the Lord, that's the things that come down vertically. See, there are also things that, that go uh, horizontally. Those are called line upon line, line upon line in Isaiah, okay? But the precepts come down vertically, and those are uh, commands and thoughts of God. And they intersect precept upon precept upon precept, line upon line upon line. They make a net, and we're all caught in that net. And in the end, they'll separate the good from the bad. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure. The Amplified has it, and bright, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord, and the Amplified has here, the reverent fear of the Lord. Amplified Bible helps sometimes because it amplifies with these statements here. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now here's it. More to be desired, that is delighted in, in the Hebrew, delighted it. More, the judgments of the Lord now we're talking about, more to be desired are they than gold. Yea, much fine gold. And fine gold means refure, a refined and pure gold, because gold isn't, isn't pure. Normally it's not pure when, it, when it's found. It has different elements in it that have to be refined out. Yea, then much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and a honeycomb. What's God just say here? He said, the fear of the Lord, that's the reverent fear of the Lord. What do you think? How come I don't, uh, uh, there's a lot of sins I like to do that I don't do. Aren't there things that you'd like to do that you, you, you're managing not to do because of God? Okay, we got another one over here. <laughs> anyway. And you're like that too. How come, well, how come you don't do that? How come you don't go out and do that crack or that uh, 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 steal this watch or do this thing or that thing? Or how come you don't do any of that? Because if you're saved and born again, because you got the Holy Spirit telling you inside that you ought not to do that, and you fear the Lord, because that's the Lord talking to you. Well, probably uh, the black cat is probably not going to be allowed in after today. Okay. He's way too rambunctious. The dog I like, the black cat, out the door, okay? He got people this, that, whatever, and he's, he's enacting himself here. So I mentioned that to you people that are, keep him out. All right. You can come, though. <laughs> okay. 
The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Enduring forever. Oh, that gives me some comfort to know that I will always have the fear of the Lord because now I know that I have something that will back me up because of my own self. Man, I'll do what I want to do. But now I know he just said it endures forever. That means I'm always going to, when I'm up in heaven, I'm always going to have the fear of the Lord. Okay, that's good because I know I got someone to back me up now. Right? You follow what I'm saying to you? That's very comforting to me to know that. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired, delighted in, are they than gold, yea, and much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. I know people, friends of mine, actually, who are collecting gold because uh, it, a hedge against this thing and that thing and, they're, and they're, other people were just money and just the, people are still money oriented. I mean nothing. They don't get it. They don't get it. That stuff doesn't mean anything. I had all that junk. I had all that junk. It's all gone now. I don't want it. I just want God. I just want God. More of God. Psalm chapter 19, verse 11 through 14. I'll read this through. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So here's how, da how David concluded this psalm. Moreover, by them, that's, that's the uh, uh, judgments of the Lord. Moreover, by them is thy, uh, thy servant warned. Warned means in the, in the Amplified, reminded, illuminated, and instructed. And in keeping them, there is great reward. In keeping what God said, in obeying God is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Which means who can understand his lapses? I don't understand why we do some things. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Secret faults. Faults that I do that I'm not aware of that I'm doing those. They actually in the Old Testament had, had a, 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 a sacrifice for that. For any errors and faults you might have committed. Some sins that you might have committed. They had a sacrifice for that. Sin offering, I think it was called. Or trespass offering. One, I'm not clear one, but one of those. Because we sometimes, sometimes we do dumb things and don't realize it's against God's law until later on and all of a sudden, oh, wait, I did that. And, wait a minute, and God said not to that. So that's the situation there. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. That's arrogant and proud sins. Oh, I can do this. I can do this. Even if it is, God said no. That's not cool. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright. Now, upright is, the Bible talks a lot about being upright. See, you and I, we were created on, on, the, on the sixth day. We were created with the animals. Well, the animals were four-footed kinds of critters, okay? That's the kind of animals we were created with. Okay, and they're four footed, walk around like this. But the Lord doesn't want us to be four footed, walk around like this. He wants us to be two footed. He wants us to stand upright. In other words, He wants us to become risen. Ah, He wants us to become risen. Do you understand? Like the Lord Jesus was risen. He wants us not to be an animal. Uh, Ecclesiastes, he says, that, uh, I would that the people, the people would, I'm paraphrasing, would know that they themselves are beasts, animals. Beasts. Beasts are in four, four, because the Lord wants us to be upright, risen. If that means anything to you. And I shall be innocent from the great transgression. And that's what we just talked about, the only unforgivable sin. That was found, I was incorrect in my, my scriptural reference. It was Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, my Redeemer. Now, let's, what does this meditation mean? 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Meditation in a dictionary, in a dictionary, it means continued thought, it means reflection, it means contemplation. In the Hebrew, meditation means a murmuring sound, a murmuring sound. That is a musical notation. And we're back to the music again, okay? Probably similar to the motor of a fusil, which is a musical thing, to indicate a solemnity and a movement, solemnness, meditation, meditation, and the meditation of my heart. And as the Lord is plucking my strings, he's affecting my meditations, you see. And my Redeemer. Redeem means in the Hebrew, the third footnote, to redeem according to the Oriental law of kinship, that is, to be the next of kin, as such, to buy back a relative's property, marry his widow, etc. It also means an avenger. It also means a deliverer, which is what we primarily are, are used to using it as. Do perform the part of next of kin. Purchase, pay ransom. Ransom, it says, but I added pay. Pay ransom. Redeemer, revenger. So in, uh, to, to summarize this, the schoolmaster, and I made that analogy that the schoolmaster was the conductor of, an, of the orchestra, okay, and indeed he is that, okay, and we are the instruments, and the Lord is plucking at the strings of our hearts. He's touching us, you see, touching us. Every pluck is a touch. You can't pluck without touching. Okay? Touch, touch, touch. He's touching us and bringing forth musical, gloryful, glorious sounds, which is our love mingled with his love. He's lovingly touching us with his love, and we are, he's, we're responding with our love back to him. In a musical symphony, in a musical symphony. And Jesus Christ now is our conductor of this orchestra. Jesus Christ is. And each of us is a willing instrument for God. A willing instrument for God. Now, if you have nothing from this message today, remember that you are an instrument. And God is using you for his glory. And if you're saved and born, if you're not saved and born again, you're not squat to God, okay? But if you're saved and born again, you're a musical instrument to God, and He's plucking your strings to bring forth the glory of God, the glory of love in you. Jesus Christ said in John three three. Let me stop a moment. We're going to have Easter Sunday. Uh, I think it's Easter Sunday. We're going to be in conjunction with another church, and we're going to have a baptism, a water baptism, out on the Gulf of Mexico again. Now, that's only about three weeks or so away. I have to get the details about all that, but uh, we're going to be going out there, and anybody who wants to, and we're going to have after, after, the, uh, after the, the baptism, uh, a mutual baptism, their people and our people, we're going to have a uh, lunch and you know, monkeying around thing. I guess we're going down to, what's the place down to the end of the, what's the park? No, the park down the end of the. Huh? Fort de Soto, yeah, Fort de Soto. So bear that in mind. I'm not sure when it's going to be, at what time or wh whatever the case is, but I'll let you know soon, I'm sure. Probably next week I'll let you know. All right, water baptism, and then we'll have a nice dinner or party down there in the afternoon. Of course, now, the only people who can actually be water baptized down there are people who are saved and born again. If you're not saved and born again, you're more than welcome to come along with us. We'll, we'll, I mean, we'll provide transportation to take you down and bring you back. But you can't be baptized. Because baptism, water baptism, is what we're doing. And there are seven different kinds of baptisms in the Bible. Water baptism is uh, a sealing. But it's symbolic. Because you've already been sealed when you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But it's also a witness to all the world. A witness of, it's using your body as a witnessing tool. Because when, when we hold you up and we ask you, are, you, are you saved and born again? Questions like that. 
and you respond yes, then we put you down under. That means you, when you went down under, you're out of sight completely from the world. And there will have people on the beaches watching and, and uh, you'll be out of sight completely from the world. That means you died in Christ. And then we'll bring it back up. And that symbolizes you're resurrected. Now, some of you will keep down longer than others. Okay. But just please understand that as it goes. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, we'll have a nice time. But the point of it is this, in, in terms of right now, what Jesus Christ said is, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, and you have to be born again to be baptized. So I'm going to ask now, well, you know, Romans 10, 9 explains what that means to be born again. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's born again. So, there's two things to this. There, it, it, that phrase there, the first is, the second uh, part of that phrase is, and believe, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. If you're willing to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for all your sins and was resurrected, then all that remains is the first part of that, which is to say a little prayer out loud. And that's why he said, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. And the word confess is there because it, it implies that you understand you've broken God's laws and are asking for forgiveness. That if thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, confess the Lord Jesus means that you're asking Jesus Christ to come into your life and be the Lord of your life. He is, after all, the good shepherd. I don't know how to get to heaven without him. I gotta follow him and you do too. So I'm asking now if there's anybody here today who would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'll say a little prayer, uh, and uh, you can say it after me and receive Jesus. Can I, I see hands of people who would like to receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Was that a hand, or were you just trying to hug your... <laughs> I got you. Yeah, I got you. Anybody else out there? Have we done this before with you? All right, that's fine. Anybody else like to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? What's your name, hon? Would you stand, please, here with us? Anybody at all? Okay, come on up here with me. Your name is Shawana? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Um, let's, let's do this. Uh, well, if you got you here, we'll just, you and I will just do this thing, okay? All right. And if uh, we're, we're going to say this prayer, uh, first let me ask you, Shawan, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for all your sins and was resurrected? Yes, I do. Okay. So we're going to say, you and I are going to say a little prayer. He's okay now. And, uh, and you folks, if you'd like to say it with us, that'd be just fine. All right? It's up to you. Um, <laughs> it's talking to God. And every single time you talk to God, there's a blessing involved. Because you're talking up to him, and he's blessing you back down. So if you'd like to have a blessing, repeat this prayer with us as well. We're just going to act like a chorus of heavenly angels escorting Shawana to the door. Okay? Say this. May I touch you? Sure. Yeah. Father God. Father God. I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I believe. I believe. That Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ. Died on the cross. Died on the cross. And paid the penalty. And paid the penalty. For all my sins. For all my sins. And was resurrected. And was resurrected. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father God. Father God. Please send your son. Please send your son. Your seed. Your seed. Your fire. Your fire. Your love. Your love. Into my heart. Into my heart. To be the Lord. To be the Lord. And Savior. And Savior. Of my life. Of my life. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you, honey. God bless you. Thank you. Please see. Man, that's the way. That's the way. We have... Uh, I think Shawana represents uh, the 175th person we've saved so far this year. This year, that's in a month and a half, or almost two months now. So we're doing, last year we averaged about five persons a day 
for every day. So because those 1,708 or nine people received Jesus as Lord and Savior. We started a little slower this year. We're averaging a little over two, about two and a half a day now. Every day. Every day. Think about that. People are getting saved through this ministry every single day. Not necessarily here. We have outreach programs we go to too where staff goes out, preaches the word of God, gets people saved. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And what are we doing? We're, we're sharing our, the music of love with all these people on the outreach programs, as well as here, the music of love. The music of love is Jesus Christ. He said, go ye into all the universe, the world, he said, and preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel is the gospel of love. And it's music. It's the music the Lord is playing on our hearts, coming out to the people. Praise God. Praise God. I have a, we'll take one more thing before we go. <laughs> Sit there quietly. Okay. This young man is going to take um, tithes and offerings. And uh, don't forget that guy right there. Good. And uh, um, God said, uh, and it, 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 what has happened is here is that uh, we trust. First thing, remember this. I'm a guy like you, you folks are. So some of the things I say, they're not right. And you need to be discernible about that. Sometimes God speaks through me, and other times I'm speaking through me. Okay? So you need to figure out which is which, number one. Okay? Secondly, you all came to church today for a blessing. I mean, it was, it's kind of a vague thing, but you all came kind of for a blessing. Well, we read you scripture here today. All scripture is a blessing. Everybody here got blessed, okay, because I read scripture. Now, the interpretation, that was the iffy part right there, okay? Right? Between me and God, you choose, okay? But now that you've gotten that blessing from the scripture, now God says, I have another blessing for you. For those of you who, who uh, uh, tithe, God said, return to me, because he's given you everything. He said, return to me, and 10% is the tithe. It's the Old Testament time. It's called holy money in, in, in the book of Leviticus. It wasn't just money. It was goats and sheep, and anybody got chickens or cows or pigs? Why, we may get down to that someday. I don't know, or back again. We, we, we should, but, but the, the point, point is, is that well, here's what God said for those of us who tithe. He said, I will open the windows of heaven above you, I will open the windows of heaven above you so you cannot contain the blessings that will flow down upon you. I will open the windows of heaven above you. In other words, right now, essentially that, what he's saying is the windows of heaven are closed in terms of the tithe in any case for you. But he said, but if you tithe, if you obey me, I will open the windows of heaven so that you cannot contain all the blessings in a rain all the blessings that will fall down upon you. That's a lot of, that's a lot of stuff. Well, that's another blessing that God wants to give to you if you obey him. Now, if you don't obey him, you're still going to get the same blessing as Matthew 5 that, that, that the unsaved people get out there. The rain's going to come down on you. The sun's going to come out and shine. You're going to have your clouds. And the normal stuff, you're going to get the same blessings they get. But you're Christians, you're children of God, you deserve more. I shouldn't say you deserve more. God wants to give you more than what he's given the unsaved people. Because you're special. You're his child. And wouldn't a father, a father always wants to give more to his children than he does other, other uh, kids, doesn't he? Well, that's what God wants to do with you. But he asks for you to obey him. And this obedience is in the form of a tithe. So I let it go at that. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us. It's a wonderful day that you have created, Lord. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. We ask, Lord, that you just uh, you bless every person here with what they need. Not what they want, Lord, but what they need to come closer to you. Because that's the greatest blessing anybody could ever receive. More of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask this. Amen.
Praise God. One more thing before we go. I keep saying that. We have to have someone to pray about the food we're about to partake of. Randy, why don't you come forth over here? That's forth enough. <laughs> Speak. Amen. God bless God. Let's go have a nice fellowship meal. God bless God.